Hello, this is me, Erika Stahl von Holstein. And this is Luca de Bielse. Welcome to Reimagine Talks, the podcast to challenge the way we think. Today we are here to reimagine ethics uh, with Professor Jerome van der Hoven. Jerome is University Professor of Ethics and Technology at Delft University of Technology and Editor-in-Chief of Ethics and Information Technology. He is currently Scientific Director of the Delft Digital Ethics Center. He is also a permanent member of the European Group on Ethics to the President of the European Commission. Jeroen, thank you very much for joining us here today to talk about some of these issues that are currently dominating our headlines. But before diving into some of the more controversial topics of today, maybe we should start at the beginning. And I'd like to ask you, what do we mean by ethics and why is it important? Well, ethics is usually defined as the reflection and the study of moral phenomena, the way people handle the, in their daily practice, in their daily lives, ethical issues pertaining to good and bad, uh, right and wrong. So they, um, they confront all kinds of uh, dilemmas and difficult uh, questions, disagreements, and they talk about it and they try to resolve them. Um, so ethics is a kind of a reflection and systematic study of those moral phenomena. So it's important to make that kind of level distinction. It's kind of a meta activity that uh, that deals with uh, with issues that everyone confronts in in daily life uh, pertaining to good and bad, and right and wrong. And it's something that we do all the time, although we are not constantly aware of it. But uh, we do more of it than we than we think. And um, so usually, you know, to take that a little bit further, um, in, in philosophy, the distinction is made between you could, you could do that study uh, and that reflection in a descriptive way. So like anthropologists or sociologists do it, you just describe the way people do that in a systematic and orderly way. Or you could uh, take a normative point of view and try to come up with theories that provide you with handles or guidelines to answer those difficult questions. Or you could even take it one meta step further up and, um, and discuss the meaning uh, of terms like justice or fairness or dignity. And, uh, and, and, and so then you, you, you get into fairly abstract and analytical philosophy about the meaning of those terms. That's what we call meta-ethics. And then there is uh, finally this uh, practical or applied ethics where you try to apply these normative ethical theories. It's good to um, remind ourselves that there is no unique, single, correct answer to these issues um, and that there are limits to the precision that we can achieve. Reminding, being reminded of Aristotle's idea that we shouldn't strive after a level of precision precision that the subject matter do, doesn't doesn't allow us to uh, to achieve. So um, it is uh, in and by itself um, uh, a hard subject matter, and still a lot of controversy about about these issues. Um, the other thing to say about ethics is is that it is, uh, of course, as you already kind of alluded to in your introduction, uh, it's it's very popular. Everyone is doing doing ethics, and it requires a a very subtle balancing act between, for example, subjective and objective points of view, partial and impartial point of, points of view, um, uh, reason and emotion, uh, self-interest and the interests of others. So that, that, is, that is also something that needs to be uh, taken on board. Um, a general characterization of this moral phenomena is usually, uh, there's a lot of agreement about that, that it's to do with uh, restraint with self-imposed constraints on the pursuit of your own goals, your own interests, or the or the interests of your group. Uh, so, and and trying to conceive of the interests and needs of others and rights of others, and have them work uh, in your decision making as constraints on the way you what you pursue, what you want to achieve. It seems that we really know more ethics. Uh, is going to be important for our uh, for our society, but uh, we also think that uh, it can be important to reimagine ethics for 
uh, dealing with the big challenges that uh, the world is facing and the different cultures that uh, have to face it. So do you think that we need to reimagine ethics and uh, that something went wrong with the ethics that we used to use? Yeah, I I, th I think it is it is about time to do that. We we cannot um, solve the problems that we're confronted with by you know the the, the ethics that we already uh, you know have developed over thousands of years and that you know have a long history two and a half thousand years before you know we go back to the times of um, of ancient Greece and uh, and Socrates and Plato and and Aristotle I already mentioned. Uh, there's a lot um, of, of very deep insights that are still very relevant today. So it's not just a matter of, you know, throw that all overboard. But we need to configure it in a different way. And therefore, we have to look at what this time and age requires. So, for example, um, look at a number of problems and then see uh, what is required to deal with those problems of the present day and age. So first, first and Foremost, I think it is very important to give um, ethics and considerations of value, moral considerations, their proper place. Right? Often we are so, you know, uh, involved in the complexities of daily life and of the pursuit of our own interests. For example, think only of, of the, the values that the market economy kind of imposes upon us. It's all about money. It's about you know, making our businesses run, uh, economic uh, parameters. And then we forget, we tend, we know that we do, we forget about, um, you know, the interests of others because we're so involved in, in the pursuit of our own interests. So greed is good. Uh, we, we know that, that dictum. Uh, but then if, if that's your motto in life, then you will, uh, you will not uh, take, take into consideration the, the interests of others. So, and then there are the complexities. We have made societies very complex, institutionally, technologically, uh, in all respects, so that it's very, very easy to hide and to be, um, you know, what we have called in, in, in some publications a moral fog. You, you, you lost the true north. Um, and it's very complex. You can always say, oh, it's so complex. I, I fail to understand and to have a good grasp of, of matters. And uh, so it's the complexity and the, um, let's say, the values that are imposed upon us by these kind of systems uh, have sometimes you know, perverse effects. So that is one thing that we need to uh, take into account. So give ethics its proper place, understand what it's about, what it requires of us, uh, and try to weave that into our institutions and procedures and, 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 and the way we, 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 we look at things. The other thing is, is that um, the ethics, our ethics originates from a time where we were basically at the fireplace. So, and now we're confronted with climate change, right? So, so we have to move the ethics that, that was developed to deal with, you know, not punching Luca on the nose. And so there is a kind of a space time contigu cont contiguity and a, a very clear causal nexus and two actors being present uh, and clear effects that I can already see what the effects are of my of my punching you. Um, now we have to scale up and we have to see that we may be dealing with, you know, the, the terrible consequences of omissions, not so much of actions. Uh, people we don't know, it's not Luca, but it's the future generations, and people do not even exist in remote corners of the world. And the way we are connected to those effects is uh, via very difficult and hard to grasp causal connections. So, so we, we, from the fireplace where everything is very close, we have a unity of time, place, and action and agents, and we have to now scale up our ethics to deal with problems that are a completely different nature. Um, and while we do that, we also have to do a little bit of the balancing act that I referred to in, in my introduction, uh, because, of course, my project, my life, my interests, my family, the people who are close to me and dear to me count for something. But in order to deal with those kind of the bigger global issues, I have to be able to relativize those at the same time, but not too much, because otherwise the meaning of my life would disappear or be undermined. So... The, the, that's that's the second one. So it's the complexity 
uh, that we need to deal with and and the bad faith that comes with it you know just going for money or for short term uh, self interests or um, uh, finding all kinds of excuses because it's it's way too complicated then the scaling up thing and then the speed is another one right so we're not used to dealing with things that have such an incredible speed we'll later on talk a little bit about artificial intelligence well that is a matter of of, of two years and things that have been produced or insights that have been formulated uh, six months ago already seem very much outdated so we have to anticipate and we have to use all the time we can get um, and therefore you know our ethics needs to be a little bit anticipatory um, the other thing is, is that uh, we have to overcome this uh, abstraction concreteness problem. So the application of our wonderful ethical ideas, so we have ethical theories and ideas about, um, about justice and fairness and democracy. Um, and, but I can you know, give you 50 different definitions of fairness or, or democracy or justice. Or, uh, so, so which one do we use and how do we go about? the application of those very abstract ideas. How do we turn that into technologies that suit us, into institutions that uh, carry out our ideals and our, and our principles? So that is another uh, very important problem. So this the design application issue. And this brings us to a very important thing that I really want to highlight and the audience and, and the listeners to, um, to think about. And it's called the ethics by design, or you know, this, this designing for your values. It's no longer good enough to say, "Oh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm a big fan of democracy." Now we will have to, on a daily basis, try to explicate and 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 uh, make very precise what we want our institutions and our technologies to be like in order to serve whatever kind of democracy we are we 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 uh, we think is worthwhile wanting. So. So the, um, the complexity needs to be dealt with, the speed of things needs to be dealt with, the scale of things needs to be dealt with, and the, 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 the gap between uh, very abstract theories and principles and concepts to the application and the embedding and the incorporation of our ethics into the things that we make on a day-to-day -day basis. So these are, you know, um, it, huge challenges and we really need to um, you know recalibrate and rethink our ethics a good example of that that is very important and I will come uh, uh, back on a little bit later is um, uh, is responsibility so we use that idea responsibility um, in a very you know traditional sense but we forget that the world has become extremely complex and com complicated and dynamic and um, the, it's, I've, I've uh, used the, uh, the analogy with trying to prepare to repair a Swiss precision watch with a hammer. You know, our tools or also our conceptual tools are not suited for the task at hand. Uh, so we need a much finer grained vocabulary of responsibilities that allows us to divvy up responsibilities and tasks in very complex, dynamic data or model or AI systems, as the European Commission now talks about, like ecosystem data and models, which is a good way of, of conceptualizing it. But then it also requires us to reconceptualize our uh, ethical vocabulary and instruments. And, and that is work that is underway. That's work that we're carrying out with our colleagues throughout Europe. So that's, uh, that's a daunting task. That's fascinating. And in a previous episode of Reimagined Talks, Manuel Castells mentioned that, uh, you know, the Internet has been designed for freedom. However, freedom, we forget sometimes that freedom does not mean good. Freedom is, is, is a different thing. And I think what we're talking about here today is really about this. How do we turn it to the good? And this is a daunting task. And I know that you um, have been part together with the other members of the European Group of Ethics in uh, publishing an opinion that looks precisely at democracy in a digital society and how do we transform this society that now has moved also online into a good society and not only a free society. Um, what do you think are the, the biggest opportunities and challenges um, in that transformation? 
Yeah, it's a very important uh, topic also, of course, with uh, European elections uh, coming up for the... Uh, uh, so Brussels is, is very much in a kind of this uh, mood of, you know, let's uh, give democracy a shot in the arm. Uh, basically, and uh, and that is really what is what is what is needed, uh, because on the one hand there are these huge threats, you know, and we know them. I mean, we've studied them now for a couple of years. We've seen election after election in the member states and in, in different parts of the world, where social media and the new technologies are used to undermine democracy and all the instruments and the institutions that we've put in place and that are hard won. Basically, that has, has uh, taken a lot of effort. Um, and now we have to defend. Um, our, we have to defend ourselves and democracy against those those attacks. Um, so misinformation, disinformation. We know that filter bubbles, uh, polarization, balkanization, how or whatever. You know, so it's 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 a very and it's it's not easy to get a get a good handle, good grasp on it. Um, but 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 that that's one part of it. The other part is that um, it is not just about elections. It's not just about, um, you know, the, the technical formal instruments or content of a democracy. Very important, of course. Um, but it is, it is more. It's like um, it's, it's, it's also paying attention to the you know, civility of the discourse of a public debate. You know, what does a public, a decent public sphere look like in, uh, which can carry and support uh, a rich and 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 enlightening debate among citizens, um, and that is uh, free for all and accessible to all, and that that are based uh, certain rules. So that that's um, and in order to achieve that is not only a defensive task um, that is required of us, but it's also an offensive task, and and that I think is a is something that is on our plate right now. So. While carrying out the defensive work on democracy and trying to salvage it and save it and and and, and fence it, um, the other one is is to engage in all kinds of experiments and use the technology to support um, um, NGOs, citizens, uh, civil society at large um, that wants to experiment with new forms of democracy. And um, the technology is wonderful for that. Uh, in the same way, it can be a, a, a very kind of uh, a big threat. It can also be a big uh, um, you know, opportunity for us. And therefore, I want to see more. I would like to see much more of those democratic experiments where we where we do what I just sketched. Uh, so designing for democracy. Uh, so come up with ideas of what we think is like representation, involvement, inclusion, uh, voice, exit, all of these, you know, very participation, all of these very important parameters or functionalities of democracy, and then try to embed them in platforms or in, uh, in, in digital technologies. And also validate, you know, and, 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 and experiment and see whether that works or not. So that is um, John Dewey, the pragmatist philosopher, who said, you know, the democracy is something that we need to experiment with every day. We need to re reinvent it every day in light of the new circumstances. And that requires efforts by all, and therefore it's upon politicians and government. Um, uh, it, it is upon them to facilitate that and to, uh, to make that possible. So that... Uh, uh, so it comes like in, in, in philosophy in general, it has a, usually a defensive part, but also in a kind of a constructive part. <laughs> well, you just uh, shown us some of the biggest challenges in bringing ethics to, from ideal to reality. But in reality, now we live uh, together with this... Uh, big discourse, big, big uh, discussion about artificial intelligence. You already mentioned that. How this is changing the context in which you work? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so AI, uh, it's clear that that's one of the big, um, the big challenges, um, technological challenges, societal challenges. Um, I would like to uh, introduce the idea that Europe has promoted in the last decade under uh, the previous, uh, but also under the present um, framework program of the European Commission. Um, and I think um, the Commission should be commended for, for the fact that they highlighted the, what they call responsible innovation. So, 
So responsible innovation is the responsible development and use and implementation uh, of of a new, of a new technology. Hmm. And um, so what does it what does it mean? Um, let, let us just briefly unpack that. Um, first of all, a technology should be geared towards and used to solve a really um, important and relevant moral problem. You know, think of a societal problem. Um, so think about energy transition, circular economy, um, in mobility and transport, uh, migration. Uh, and we know what, what the list of those problems are that we urgently need to solve climate change. Look at the UN uh, Sustainable Development Goals, for example. Uh, we previously talked about the Millennium Goals, but we know there is a, there's a huge set of problems and, and they need to be addressed urgently. So um, several um, members of the family of the UN have already said this AI should be geared towards solving those uh, problems, those societal problems. Um, and we can use some help, as I've already said. Um, so, so responsible innovation is not about, oh, I have thought about something new. I have a new functionality. That's, you know, that's great. You know, that, but that's not per se good. Right. That, that requires an independent argument of why that is good. And um, so the first question is, it's innovative, but is it good? Will it really help us to solve one of the, the big problems that we have, that we're confronted with in this 21st century? So that's the, the first the first point. The second one, doesn't uh, aspect of that, of responsible innovation, is doesn't it create new problems that are even worse or as bad as the, as the problem we're trying to solve? Or... Um, uh, does it exacerbate existing problems? Um, and um, a, a very important aspect is, will, we, will it allow us to proceed in a way that will allow us to take our responsibilities, that all relevant actors, the users, the consumers, the people who produce the people who make money of it, will be able to act responsibly? So that is also, as I alluded to before, that is becoming a design issue, right? We cannot just assume assume that everyone will be able to take responsibility, that will act around that new technology and its applications in a responsible fashion. That will, will, will be something that we will have to be explicit, de, uh, explicitly designed for. Um, the other thing is that... Um, uh, so it becomes a moral endeavor. Innovation is not like, oh, yuppie, we've we've found something new and it will make us all rich very soon. No, it's it is it is new functionalities, wonderful new engineering uh, capabilities that will allow us to reach solutions to our common problems, urgent problems, sooner rather than later, and in a responsible fashion. Um, if you do that, if you proceed in this way, you will find that you often will be able to reconcile value conflicts by having them as requirements on the table. Like, for example, Europe has been big on privacy respecting technologies. Right. Why do you think that we were so innovative with privacy respecting technologies? Well, because we thought privacy and data protection were very important. And we didn't want to compromise on them. But at the same time, we wanted to use the functionality and the wonderful capabilities that IT and digital technologies could offer. So you, ha you see you have a conflict. On the one hand, you want to move forwards uh, and use it for all kinds of good. And on the other hand, you don't want to compromise on privacy. Now, privacy enhancing technologies, privacy by design, is the way forward. Privacy by design is an innovation that will allow you to have your cake and eat it, to do two things at the same time that you don't want to compromise on, you don't want to renege on. So, so that, is, that, is a, that is an example that we can use. It's responsibility, safety, security by design, where you try to satisfy as much of your uh, values and your responsibilities in one fell swoop by thinking of something new. So um, that is, I think, the wonderful, uh, you know, the, the, the emergent, let's say, emergent property of this, of this take on innovation that turns innovation into a moral concept. It's not just a frivolous thing, uh, you know, a, a wonderful, it's at the same time, of course, uh, a nice thing and it's exciting. It can make us, uh, in, indeed, it brings us some, some, some profits and some benefits economically and financially, but 
don't forget, this is basically a moral endeavor. And I think that's that's a very interesting that applies. Now this is a, a, a long introduction to come to your to your to your question back. And this this needs to be applied to AI as well. Right. So we have to study and look for the opportunities of how AI can help us to solve those. This is AI for good. You know, how can it help us to solve those societal problems while at the same time serving those moral values and not compromise on them? That will push us to, you know, to explore those frontiers where really interesting innovations are. And really interesting, I mean, that they expand the set of moral obligations that we can satisfy. That's the, I think, uh, what is upon us. That is fascinating. And I think if I understand you correctly, you feel that the age of move fast and break things is over. This is not the time to do that, that anymore. We need to start absolutely becoming yeah. more responsible about how we deal with these yes. enormously yes. powerful um, yes. innovations and technologies. And one of the questions that I had now that we're coming towards the end of the interview, I'd love to continue this discussion for hours, but that is um, we obviously need to see a huge shift in how we think about innovation, how we think about developing this online world that we're now inhabiting and that is guiding us. There's been a lot of negative, obviously, press um, recently saying that it's it's these new technologies that are ending democracy, that are, are you know, pushing us all, fragmenting our society. And I like that you're still optimistic that there is a way out of this, that if we change the way we are doing things, this could also be this enormous uh, positive force towards democracy, towards freedom and towards all these values that we want to do. Um, as a last concept, what would your last advice be? And do you think that we need a broader change in narrative about how we think about this to help us um, revolutionize the way we interact with these uh, new technologies and this new innovation? Well, the first thing um, I already um, mentioned that when we started about about ethics and, and uh, what is going wrong and what we should do to reimagine ethics. And I think um, one of the first things to do in now and in the, in the near future is just to call a spade a spade. You know, we have to... Um, you know, have the courage to call ethical issues and morality, give its proper place. And as we, for a long time, we have been kind of moving around that a little bit, you know, so it's, it's for the faint hearted and it, that morality and ethics, well, that's not really, you know, uh, that should have a really important place in our education and in training of engineers and people who do business administration. So it's no longer uh, that there should be a real and heavy counterpoint to, let's say, um, decision theory and rational choice theory and microeconomics 101 uh, that, that people who move into business, uh, you know, always take and, and take very seriously as they should. But, but there should be a, a really kind of uh, a strong um, a drive towards, towards ethics and, and not shy away from calling these, these things ethics and, and, and study these things in a serious way, like we also study other things in a serious way. Right? So that that is, um, you know, the last uh, 50 years that is that has not been en vogue. But we have to uh, we have to do that again. We have to have the courage to do that again and have conversations. That I think that is the almost the the, the, the most important thing. And we have to be very careful not to let, uh, let's say, the, the corporate world and big tech have the last word on um, these very important infrastructural and public goods and common goods that we have. I mean, that, that, that is something that we, the, the citizens or the, the population, uh, should, should be thinking about and should be deciding upon. And it's not something that should be um, you know, forced upon us because of some, you know, um, quarterly revenue thinking or short termism or uh, w whatever. So that that is, I think, um, we we are uh, putting the, car the, the 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 cart before the horse, right? So it's it's the ethical horse that is that is that should be uh, where, where where it should be, and um, and so now we are you know taking guidance from, as I said. Um, Profit and 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 uh, quarterly revenues and short-term gains, not unimportant, 
but it, they should uh, they should have their proper place. It's uh, it's not about eyeballs and it's not about f- uh, follows and likes. Um, in in a, in a, in an interesting societal political arrangement, these things come as a result of merit or something that you have something interesting to say, not you know not the other way around. So. Um, uh, that is, I, I think, the, the, the most important lesson. The other thing is the, the design thinking. We, we should really not release into society things um, uh, any longer that, that we haven't carefully thought about. Uh, and uh, we can defend in terms of the underlying values or the values that are embedded in them. Uh, and that have been carefully scrutinized in terms of um, you know, long-term consequences that they may have. Um, if there are none, that, that's fine, you know. So that that uh, we, we shouldn't be, uh, we should also be able to enjoy a life. And and but um, but yeah. So my my main lesson is is to give ethics its proper place uh, and take it very serious, as we take other things very serious. Well, thank you very much, Professor uh, Van der Hoven, for joining us here and for underlining the need to reimagine ethics, give it its proper place and really put it at the center in how we um, see innovation moving forward. This will require an enormous transition, but I do feel that the public is on your side. There's a long, there's an outcry, I would say, for doing things differently. So um, let's start to um, think design and to rethink um, ethics. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for having me. Yep. (laughs) And good luck with your work. Cheers. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye.